Praxis Prepper. Hey everybody, this is Praxis, and welcome back to the third installment of my interview with Arthur Bradley on EMP and all that. If you haven't seen the first two episodes, make sure you check those out because we go over, you know, what is EMP, how terrified should you be, and everything like that. You know, we get you all like whipped up into a frenzy there, so you're horrified, and now we'll save you by telling you some simple things and maybe, you know, and also maybe some complicated things, but different things that you can do to improve your situation, to make your, uh, you know, if this ever happened, to make your lot slightly better or possibly much better. So first off, thank you very much for being back with me again, Arthur. Sure, thank you for having me again. Um, so yeah, you heard in the intro, what I'd love to talk about today are what are some things that people can actually do? It's great to get like terrified by things and you know, just worry that they're gonna happen and losing sleep and everything. But what is some real stuff that people can do to actually uh, make their situation better if something like this ever happens? Right, so there's sort of two different categories of preparations, right? One is very specific to an EMP and we can talk about that second, but let's just talk about basic preparedness first. And I'm sure most of your viewers are well on their way to this, but it's the place to start. So an EMP is considered a high impact, low frequency event, meaning it's gonna do a lot of damage, but it does not gonna happen very often, right? It's sort of like an asteroid strike or other things that when they happen, they're gonna be a big deal, but you don't expect them to happen every day. So for those kind of preparations, you really have to have a solid preparedness plan where you've addressed long-term food needs, water, shelter, you know, all of sort of your basic necessities figured out, right? And maybe even in some renewable way, because sometimes you can't stock enough. For example, water is very difficult to store enough water to last for more than about a month anyway. And so you have to figure out your long-term strategy for these types of events. So the place I would tell people to start is think about your basics. Um, I wrote a handbook on practical disaster preparedness and in that, that's what I focus on, is what are the 14 basic needs and how do you go about sort of setting up uh, preparations to meet those needs when things go wrong. And that's where I would say people should start. Yeah, I, I, I know that you don't want to sell yourself here because it, it doesn't seem like that's your personality, but I will do it. I've seen his website. He has a lot of great information. I'm going to put it, here's his website right here. Uh, he's got, a, like you said, he's written a lot of books. There is just so much information. I go there f quite frequently when I want to kind of like fact check things and, and get my head straight. So I would highly recommend it's disasterpreparer.com, right? Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would definitely recommend going over there and uh, you're just learning about uh, all that stuff because he, he does a really great job over there. So, I mean, that's all the general stuff. And I, I and, and you're right. All the viewers of my channel are totally A plus when it comes to that stuff. So we, we're all set there, dude. Great. But uh, let, let's talk a little bit about um, the specific things to, to EMP, like, you know, I know people talk about Faraday cages and, you know, burying stuff underground. I, I mean, there's even this like microwave thing. People take like microwave ovens and, and throw stuff in. I don't know whether there's anything to really demonstrate that microwave oven ovens really even work for any of that stuff. Uh, where do we start if we want to like protect some of our electronics and things like that from this kind of event? Right. So there's a few different preparations. So the first thing is you need to recognize there's two different threats from an EMP. The first one is the conducted pulse that will come in on the power lines, and it will be tremendous, okay? So anything that's plugged in at the time of an EMP is very likely going to be damaged. If there's not some protection in place, it's very likely going to be damaged. So that's bad news. So anything that you don't need to have plugged in, you could unplug, and that does a lot to help protect that piece of equipment. Because you can pretty much consider anything plugged in is very likely damaged. I should unplug it if I value it if I'm not using it, okay? That's the first thing. And there are ways to protect things that are plugged in, but we can talk about that later. So unplug is the first step. The second step is if you have sensitive pieces of electronics, for example, radios, uh, things like things that you you know know pick up energy quite well. Radio is a great example of that. Even a spare cell phone, things like that, you know, are designed to pick up RF energy. Those things are very likely going to be damaged by the radiated pulse that comes through the air. And so anything that you can shield in some way, you can help to ensure their protection. And that's where Faraday cages come in. Faraday cage is really just a conductive enclosure. You're just putting things inside of a metal box of some sort to help reduce the fields that that piece of electronics would see. And we can talk about various ways to build those, but it's proven an effective way to protect electronics. We use that all the time. Uh, I work sometimes during the day in a giant Faraday cage that's the size of a small room, and it's to keep out RF interferences from local uh, radar stations and other things from essentially putting energy into the systems I'm working on. And so Faraday cages have been known about for a long time. They work very well. Um, they help protect things. Some things are more difficult to put in a Faraday cage. For example, your car, right? Well, it's hard to build a room, you know, that's big enough to drive your car in. So I come up with one way, and I'm not trying to pitch the product, but more the idea. 
And the idea was that I had this idea a couple years ago, maybe three or four years ago, um, that it'd be nice if you had a conductive car cover that you could drape over your car when it's not being used that would help reduce the fields that the electronics would see. Unfortunately, as far as I could tell, nobody made such a thing because it'd be kind of expensive. And so what I did is, I first, it's a funny story, I actually made my own conductive car cover out of aluminum foil and plastic, my, me and my kids. And there's some photos in my EMP book, but we built this giant car cover, put it over my car, and did a bunch of testing on it. And the neighbors were peeking out the windows, as you can imagine, right? It was something to see. It's, it sounds like the, the, the classic crazy prepper story. <laughs> it was a classic crazy moment. And, you know, we had antennas set up and everything. It was just really weird. Uh, but, we, but we verified that, yeah, it really did help. And so then what I did is I thought, well, people aren't going to build their own, their own cover out of plastic and aluminum foil. So I, I bought about 25 different conductive cloths, and there's various types that are made. And I tested them to see which ones would work well for a cover on a car like that. And I narrowed down to a couple of them out of those 25. And um, I actually market one of them and sell one of them. Again, I'm not pitching the product, just the idea. But creating a large cover out of a conductive cloth and draping it over the car is an example of sort of creating a shielded, a shielding between your car and anything that would come from above in the atmosphere. Now it's not exactly a perfect Faraday cage, but it is shielding and shielding works well to reduce fields as well. So that's an example for cars. So Faraday cages and, and different types of covers, they, people use those on generators as well uh, to cover their generators for example. Uh, and then third, sometimes people use um, what are called uh, ferrites, which are really just inductors that you put around a cable, for example, to try and help the surges that might come on those cables. Now, ferrites will not protect equipment that's plugged in by themselves. It's just too much energy for a ferrite. Ferrites saturate. But they might on small scale electronics that have a cord attached. And so you could put a ferrite around that cord that would help reduce those fields. So ferrites are another useful trick to help protect electronics. Go one right here. Yeah, they're right. They're on all kinds of pieces of equipment to help reduce those fields. Now, you did ask me about um, different types of Faraday cages. We can talk about whether microwaves work or whatever you'd like to talk about on that. Yeah, well, yeah. let's just dispel that myth right off the bat. I, th that's just bogus that microwaves actually function in that capacity, isn't it? Well, it's not actually a myth. Um, I wondered the same thing because, as you as you probably point out, there's a there's a glass door on most microwave ovens, right? And you can see this large space, and you think the energy is going to get in and out quite easily. But my guess is that that glass door has some metalized sputtering in it or some kind of a grid in it. And so what I did is I tested, I put a spectrum analyzer which detects RF energy inside of a microwave. I pointed an antenna at it and I essentially turned on and went through frequency to see how well it blocked the, the signal. And it did a pretty decent job. So makeshift Faraday cages out of microwave ovens, I would give the thumbs up. I would say they're pretty good. Oh, okay, okay. That's really surprising. I um. I'm really surprised by that. Okay, uh, well, let's uh, so old microwave oven or current microwave oven, as long as it's not plugged in, I presume, uh, are are you know you know decent techniques. What if you have a little bit more lead time and you wanted to kind of create a Faraday cage of your own? Is there a certain material that you would uh, create that out of? As far as I know, it's just it's a box without any gaps in it that just lets the uh, energy kind of wrap around whatever's on the inside. Uh, would you have any tips for people about like, you know, you mentioned aluminum foil, like what types of materials would you think would make a good Faraday cage and, and like how big can the seams be and, and all that kind of stuff? Right. Yeah. So there's a bit to know about, about that. Um, so it really, the first thing is any metal is okay. You can use aluminum or copper or anything. So whatever is cheap, which is why a lot of people use aluminum foil. Um, it's okay to have holes and it. it's an interesting experiment. Talk about odd things. You can take a galvanized garbage can, the big metal garbage cans, right? And people love to use those as Faraday cages because they're cheap. You can go buy one for 20 bucks or something. And they put their stuff inside and normally you want to tape the seam around the, the lid where the lid goes on because that leaks RF energy in it. And if you use just a cheap, you know, metalized duct tape, you can tape it up for, you know, nearly nothing and you have a really very decent uh, Faraday cage by doing that. So it's a cheap way of doing it. A lot of people do it that way. Um, but, but an interesting experiment is this. I always ask people, what do you think will happen uh, if I take a drill and let's say I put a, an eighth inch drill bit on it and I start drilling holes in the side of the can? And, and most people will say, oh, well, you know, your, your shielding is going to weigh down, everything's going to get damaged. And it's a fun thing to do if you put an analyzer in there and you start to drill holes and you just sort of space out the holes every six or ten inches, you'll find that the shielding drops hardly at all. 
that the shielding is almost just as good as it was before you started drilling the holes. Now that's really interesting to me because I mean, you, you said yourself that even just that tiny little gap around the lid, you want to tape that up. Is the issue the, the size of the holes in terms of these energy waves going through? They can't get through a little hole, but if you have a big, very thin gap, they can get through? Yeah, no, you're exactly right. That's exactly right. You end up with the, with the small gaps, the long seams, you end up acting as a very efficient antenna, whereas small holes with a short dimension across them, they don't really let in RF energy very well. And so it's a fun thing to show that, you know, sometimes people get so concerned about like the holes around the rivets, for example. They say, oh, you know, I've got this tiny hole I can see around the rivets. And I tell them, well, don't worry about the tiny holes. Worry about the long seams. That's the, what's going to compromise your ferrite cage. All right, well, thank you. That, that's really helpful. I think that'll help a lot of people uh, guide them in terms of how crazy they need to be over things. That's interesting to hear. Okay, so those are all some great things you can do uh, to eliminate that, that threat that just kind of comes from ambiently down through the air. Is there anything you can do uh, aside from like unplugging your devices that will allow them to survive that conductive threat that comes down through the wires? I mean, is, uh, I mean, are there any surge protectors that you can buy or is really the only way that you can do it is to constantly be unplugging stuff? And I, I don't get me wrong, that would save a lot of energy. That'd be awesome. But I mean, you know, there's only so many minutes in the day and I can imagine people getting a little lax with that. Is there anything people could, you know, could get that could protect them? Right. So there are a lot of good quality surge protectors on the market today, but there are none designed to really protect for an EMP, at least none that are effective. Let me put it that way. Um, so I recently took on this challenge. Uh, I'd say a, a few months ago, people started pestering me enough to say, hey, you ought to try and go and invent something like that. Since I have a strong background in electronics, I thought I would take a look at it. And so what I did is I bought, I don't know, a dozen or so different surge protectors that are out there, the, the best I could find, and I took them all apart. And I looked inside them to see how they were built, and they are all built exactly the same. It's really amazing. Um, they're all, they all use what are called metal oxide varistors in them. And essentially what those varistors do is when you get a large pulse of energy, they, they conduct and they take that energy away before it gets to the home. And it works pretty well, so it helps if you have a nearby lightning strike, let's say, it helps that prevent that energy from getting into your home electronics. Unfortunately, it's neither fast enough for the E1 part of, a, of an EMP, so the E1 still comes through. And it won't handle the E3 pulse, which is a very, very slow pulse. Um, the E3 actually will destroy every surge protector on the market. And so it isn't, they're not going to do anything for an E3 just because they're so long, it's so long in duration. And so, what I thought is, well, why don't I try and invent a new surge protection device? And that's what I've essentially taken on in the last few months. The product is called the EMP Storm. And I took, I took that name because EMP is one of the threats and a solar storm is the other threat. So I sort of put them together, right? And the idea of the surge protection device is really pretty simple. You mount it to your breaker box, just like other surge protection devices. But it has three different stages of protection in it, one for each element of an EMP. And so one stage of it is meant to protect against E1, one stage is against E2, and one stage is against E3. And by having all three of them, and they work kind of in conjunction where one kicks in when the other fails and that sort of thing um, to provide protection. And so I'm in the process of designing and building that product right now. Uh, I'm taking pre-orders for it for people that are interested in it, uh, but it's going to be the first of its kind as far as I know in the entire world. Well, that's... Uh, it it's another thing that I don't have that I didn't know that I needed until just now, and now I feel grossly inadequate for not having it next to my breaker box. All right. Well, at least there's something. Is that some, it sounds like it's still in development, though. Is that something that's like, you know, a year off? Or when, when are you thinking you might have that ready for people to uh, take advantage of? Yeah, so the design of it's almost finished. The, the, and then I do a prototype phase, and then I have to do a final build and a certification through Underwriter Labs. And then a, the product should ship sometime late summer, this coming late summer. They're, I've taken pre-orders, they're about $300 a piece, so it's not cheap, but it's not tremendously expensive either. It's one of those preparations you have to decide if it makes sense for you. Well, that's, a, that's nice to hear that there's at least something that people can do about it. Thanks. So, Well, thank you very much for your time here. I know I, I've learned quite a bit. I, I felt I was reasonably knowledgeable, uh, but even just in this discussion right now, I found out there were a couple things that I thought were true that were just total BS. And that's a good day for me when I get proven wrong because it means I'm smarter now than I was about 15 minutes ago. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Sure, thank you. Well, if you uh, enjoyed listening to Arthur's uh, you know, talk about this, this is just scraping the surface of everything that he knows. I wanted to just kind of introduce him to you guys and let you know that he exists and he's out there. 
Uh, there's a link to his website down below if you want to go over there. He's the real deal. He knows what he's doing. It's not just a line of like mythology that he, like, he heard something somewhere. He actually tests his stuff out and he knows for real. So if you guys want to learn more about it, disasterpreparer.com. There's a link down below. I hope you enjoyed this interview series. I know I certainly did. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.